inside your bulletins and print out up the outline, go ahead and uh, grab a pencil and pen. Fill in the, the blanks if you would. As I say all the time, my professors in college uh, always told me that a short pencil is better than a long memory. Yeah. You've heard this stat before. By Tuesday, you've forgotten almost 80% of everything you learned on Sunday. So if you think you're going to memorize it, you better have a photographic mind or confess that you just lied one of the other because by Tuesday you're not going to remember most of it. You may remember a slide or a joke or an illustration, but it's going to be difficult. You write these things down, it, it changes you because all of a sudden it becomes more than just a wish. It becomes a, a guarantee. Getting a fresh start, uh, that's really what God wants you to have. When we read that scripture as we did earlier, Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, as part of the formula on getting a fresh start, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, what, what we find is really difficult is <laughs> surrendering. Surrender is hard, isn't it? Can't you? How many of you admit that you have habits you'd love to change, but you've had them for so long, you're not sure you can change them? Well, this is why surrender is so hard. Uh, there's too much of us. You know, We are so dominant and, and we're so habitual that we practice ourselves way too long. It's like an actor that doesn't come out of character when they're filming a movie. It's the same thing for us, but on a legitimate lifestyle basis. We usually fight God. We're usually in this battle with Him all the time. Who's going to be first? Who's going to be in control? And that's what we do. We end up fighting God. Uh, how many of you would admit that you're a little stubborn? How many of you admit you're really stubborn? How many of you admit the person didn't raise their hand is stubborn? Okay. Yeah. We, we think we're smart, too. That's the other one. You know, we, we think that we're smart. We think we got it all figured out. I got this sort of mentality. And the reality is when God looks at us, <laughs> no, you really don't. Because I see what's coming up, and you really don't have what you think. You're ignorant about worship. You really don't understand what worship is. It isn't just singing the songs. It's so much more than that, and we'll look at that in a minute. And then we lack clarity with God. We don't really have this transformative relationship with God where He can speak in and to our lives, and then we put it into practice. That's really what the goal is. Not just hearing from God, but then applying it to our lives. If you really want to get a fresh start, if you really want big changes with big results, you want to have a fantastic, you want to have the best year of your life, you can't just listen to what's going on. You're going to have to somehow apply what's going on. Let's pray. Father, as we go into uh, this message of getting a fresh start, I pray uh, that you'll help us uh, surrender. It's tough. It's not easy. If it was easy, I'd be out of a job. So I know it's not. I know uh, we struggle with uh, stubbornness. We struggle with our own way and our own pattern. And in fact, it starts in our mind. We, we have a mindset that is ingrained, in, and it's very difficult to break that pattern. I pray that uh, as we go through this message, you, Holy Spirit, will do something that mankind can't. And that's change hearts and minds and soften us in such a way that uh, we get in line and in, in step with a holy, omniscient, a God that knows everything, the past, the present, but most especially the future, and uh, who holds all the keys to all of our questions, all of our answers, all of our dreams and desires, <coughs> and even quenching the, the spirit of fear that may crawl up against us. So I pray, Holy Spirit, you use even myself who struggles and is flawed and sinful at times, uh, but is trying passionately to walk with you. We ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Big changes for big results. I mean, what good is changing if there's no results, right? Isn't that true? I was wondering about people that drank decaf coffee. If I'm going to drink coffee, I'll, I want to get the buzz, right? Uh, you know, why would you drink something like that if you're not going to do it? Why would, and I saw in the other room, as we set up all the, the pastries and the, and the cookies. And the, how many of you had cookies and goodies during the Christmas holiday? Okay. So the rest of you, you can quietly ask forgiveness. Uh, you know, and, and then we have bagels and, and, and English muffins and, and all the different uh, cream cheeses you put on. I you love that. Uh, and and then, then I saw over there my wife brought in rice cakes. Anything that has cake on it and doesn't look like and tastes like a cake, that, that's, that's manipulation right there. I don't think that qualifies as cake. And, and if, but if I'm going to make the changes I want, is I've made a promise to myself and to God and to my family 
that, that I would continue to get in better shape and lose weight. Over the last month, do you realize how hard it's been to take on that challenge in the month of December to lose weight? I weighed in at 200, almost 260 pounds. I weighed myself last night. I am 245. I know, it's almost like a golf tournament. Ooh, wow. <laughs> you know, my goal is, is, is to lose another you know, 15 to 20 pounds in the next month. That's what my goal is. You know what that means? That means that anything that smells good, tastes good, looks good, even a commercial, I don't even want to listen. <laughs> my daughter Allison made these sweet rolls yesterday, and they were getting ready to go exercise, and I was studying, getting things done, and she made these, these cinnamon rolls in the oven. Do those have smell? I think they, 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 they must pump it up with extra smell in there. And, and they're like filling up the room. They almost came in color across the table. And, and then she puts the frosting in and she goes, am I putting too much? I go, just do it and eat it and get out of here. I, I, I could not handle it anymore. That's just wrong. Right? I want, I got to make big changes for big results. And that means every single thing and all the stuff that was given me throughout Christmas season, I have stayed away from I've, I've nibbled here and there. And that's really difficult for somebody over the course of time. I've eaten everything I wanted to because I've always burned it off. But I have to be serious about my health as I get older. I want big changes, but I have to have big results to go with it. Now, when we look at this scripture, uh, I, I want you to see uh, three things. You need the right motivation to surrender to God. You really have to. Take your Bibles and go all the way back to the book of Genesis in chapter 32, if you would. You know, you have to have something, uh, a right motivation, you, you've got to have something called leverage that gets you to make that decision. You know, if, if you want to make a change, there has to be enough that pushes you to want to make that change. But if you don't have enough motivation, and here's part of the problem, we as Americans get comfortable really easy. Would you admit to that? The hardest thing to do is to be on the cutting edge in life because we typically set up our lives to where it is comfortable, which means that the habits, the choices, and the characters we have at that present time will probably stay with us for the rest of our lives because of that comfort zone we've built. That's difficult. So it says you have to have the right motivation if you're really, truly going to surrender to God. You know, you really don't admit something. When we were kids, I remember I would get uh, hurt or I'd hurt my brothers or they'd hurt me or whatever it was. The funny thing was, is my mom... Uh, would not believe that we were truly hurt unless we were really, truly crying. As a child, did you ever fake cry as a child? No. no. Yeah. There's a lot of lying going on in church today. It's just remarkable. We're going to do a message next week on repentance, you know. <laughs> you think about it, and, and you come in, you whine like, oh, this really hurt. And, and, and my mom was a master, like my wife is, to read and say, okay, no, I don't think so. There, there's no real tears. But when you come in and you got to catch your breath before you tell your mom, that's an authentic cry, right? Mm -hmm. I saw a kid in the store the other day, and he kept pulling these little cheese balls off. First, I was envious because he was grabbing stuff I can't have. And then second, of all, his mom said, put it back. And he wouldn't do it. So he grabbed one more and threw it in the basket, and she went, whop, like that. And he grabbed one more. It wasn't hard enough. Oh. Ooh. So I just stopped because I couldn't, I couldn't get a better illustration. I thought, this is money in the bank, right? And she goes, put it back. And, and he went like that. He put his head up like that. And I went, oh, my goodness. I get to see everybody you know, going black, right? And she goes, bam! You can hear the pop on her. Uh, and the little guy's we're in. And he went, and he caught his breath. And he stood there. And I go, that's authentic right there. And, I, I, and she looked at me like, you want one too? You know, like, <laughs> You know, it's got to be, you've got to have the right motive. That's why he says, I beseech you, I cry out, I urge, I, I scream to you that you've got to do this. Do it before God makes you want to do it. Isn't that interesting? Make the choice before he makes it for you. Brethren and brothers, by the mercies of God, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Isn't that great that God doesn't make you pay for everything you've done wrong? None of us would be here. By the mercy of God, that ye, and you can tell this is old King Jimmy, right? When you say ye, okay, <laughs> that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The problem, and I remember my mentor telling me this years and years ago, the problem with a living sacrifice is we tend to crawl off the altar. We make that promise, and then five minutes later, we're off doing our own thing. We make that promise on a Sunday, and by Tuesday, I'm doing my own thing again. 
That's a very, you, you have to have the right motivation. You know, in Genesis 32, he says, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. <clears throat> now he's getting another chance here. You've got to realize that, that he was a schemer, he was a manipulator, and even though he's working for Laban, his father-in-law, and he worked 14 years for the wife he wanted and had to take on the one that wasn't attractive with him, he's upset that he's got all these extra duties. In fact, as God started to bless him, uh, Laban made it harder by saying, you know, I want you to separate the sheep and the goats and the ones that are speckled and the ones that are just of one color. Uh, the ones of one color, which are normal, he says, the ones that I want. And the other ones you can keep. He's trying to say, yeah, I'm going to cut you off. Laban was just as self-centered as anybody else was, including Jacob. He thought about me, myself, and I first. And then if, you, uh, if I had some leftovers, I gave it to you. What God did, he, he switched it. And all these goats and sheep became speckled. And all of a sudden, Laban's group was smaller. So he started getting envious. And Laban's sons were getting envious because now Jacob not only had their sisters and Laban's daughters, but he also had the best group of the flock. He had more money, if you were going to consider it money, that was money in those days, more resources than even the guy who owned the farm. Remarkable. The problem was God's calling him back. He goes, I want you to go back to your land. I want you to go back to where your forefathers raised you. I want you to go back and essentially face your brother Esau who wants to wipe you out, who hates you. I want you to face your problems. I want to face your fears. Have you ever come up against one of your problems or one of your fears and didn't want to deal with it? Have you ever met a part of your life, a character trait, and a lack of integrity, a breach in who you're supposed to be in God's sight instead of what you want people to believe in, and then you had to face it because God said, enough's enough. You've gone so long, now it's time to stop the brakes and take a good look at yourself. Because if I'm going to bless you, I can't let you go in the way you are. And see, God wants to bless each and every one of you based on the fact that He loves you. Not based on how good you are. Thank God He doesn't base it on how good we are. Amen? Amen. Grace is giving you something that you didn't deserve. See, he, he's trying to get you to be motivated based on mercy. I don't, I don't make you pay for all the mistakes you made. But he says, on the flip side, once you get that, once you surrender to me, once, once you make yourself available, he says, then the grace starts to fly over the top. And we'll look at that in just a minute. It's fascinating that the angels come, he gets another chance with, with, with just the supernatural, right? You always wonder, why don't I come into contact with the supernatural? Why don't I come into contact with God in a very personal a very real and authentic way. Well, more often than not, the reason is because we're stubborn. Because we, we've chosen a set of steps we've taken in our lives and has slowly gotten us away from God. You ever wonder when you feel alone or, uh, you know, that God's not around? Guess who moved? He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. There are promises there for you, but he says, more often than not, you're too far away. And you can't hear me. You know, I always like uh, the gym, right? Uh, in December, the gym looks one way, and in January, all the people that make New Year's resolutions show up, right? And that's how it's been all, all month long. That, that's what it looks like in December, and that's what it looks like right now. You know, All of a sudden, there's all these guys that are showing up that, that uh, they blow me away, and they take up all the machines and all the benches and, and all the cardiovascular machines. And I come in there and go, oh my goodness, I look at the guys that I normally see, all the parking spaces are taken, drives me crazy, and everybody's in there checking themselves in the mirror. Like that one week's really made that big a difference, right? It reminds me of guys like this. I can't wait to see, use the elliptical after the January gym posers leave, right? And these guys kissing a non-existent bicep. You know, a month after resolving and beginning to shape, 30%, 36% of new gym members stop going. Don't worry, you'll have your gym back soon enough. But that's part of it. You know, we think we're motivated, but even if we have what's in front of us, we don't apply what we have. That's why even though you may say, look, all these people shouldn't be here, even when you have it, you haven't done anything with it. You know, I like what happens in Russia. They just established this a while back. Subway ticket machine in Moscow accepts 30 squats as payments. They need to do that here, don't they? You know, you want to shop at Safeway? you got 30 squats to pop before we take you through the line, right? Yeah. Can you imagine going through in and out and they go, okay, get out of your car and give me 20 push-ups if you want that double-double, right? 
Yeah, there'd be a lot of people that start eating at Subway. They, they wouldn't be eating an In-N-Out burger. But see, the motivation we have oftentimes is not enough. Jacob gets this one more shot here in, in chapter 32. The angels come into his, his lifestyle, into his world, and kind of shakes things up. Verse 2, Jacob saw, saw them and he said, this is God's camp. He automatically realized that where he was, where he lived, is not mine, it's not Jacob's, this is God's place. When God shows up in your life, it's not your home, it's not your car, not your truck, not your bank account, not your health, not your relationships. Uh, none of these things are yours to begin with. He gives it to us as a way of monitoring or supervising what we have. The beauty of this is, when they showed up, could you imagine if an angel decides to show up in your neck of the woods, and shows up in your place of residence, where you work, where you live, where you eat, would you still be standing there thinking it's yours, or would it be God's? See, God is trying to break through this morning by saying, I'm already relevant where you are. I need you to admit it's not you, it's me. Jacob sent messengers. In fact, he called it Manahayim. It's really, uh, the Hebrew word uh, literally means to be a double camp. It's no longer mine. I've included somebody else to kind of take ownership of this. Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau. His brother in the land of Seir, the country of being. He'd been putting this off for a long time, dealing with Esau. You ever procrastinated? You ever put something off because you know it was going to be hard? You knew it was going to be difficult? God gave you an early vision, an early dream, or an early warning, and he says you need to do these certain things in order to get what you're going to get, which will be the very best that you will get in your entire life. He says, but in order to do that, he says, what's going to happen is I'm going to show up, and then I'm going to challenge you. And he says, Esau is the first thing I want you to deal with. What is the one thing going on this year you knew you were supposed to deal with? And as soon as I said that, you, something flashed through your head. There's something back there you put off and you said, I'm not going to deal with this. In fact, you know what, I know I'm supposed to. And he says, but I, I, I just I, I'll think of a reason why not. You know, you know what happens when you have something you're supposed to do and then you put it off? That's called an excuse. And most people have become kings and queens of excuses. But God doesn't want you to do that way. He wants to instill within you something fantastic. He says, Say to my Lord Esau, thus your servant Jacob, uh, I have dealt with Laban and stayed there until now. He was there for a long time. Do you realize that, that 20 years he had spent away from his home camp? I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. He already knew it was going to be a tough war, to, but he was still dealing with it on his style and approach. His resources, not God's. And we'll see how that changes. The messengers returned to Jacob in verse 6. We came to your brother Esau, and he is also coming to meet you. Uh, look at this. But he's not coming with gifts. Look what he's coming with. With 400 men that are with him. That doesn't sound good, does it? It sounds like he's coming to do business in a different way. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And you may think about a problem you have in your life that you're going, well, I'm not sure what, what the outcome looks like. You know, in, in fact, the odds seem to be stacked against me. You know, we do a, a variety of things for a variety of reasons. And it's fascinating when you think about that because there are several ways in which, you know, even employers do the same thing. They try to get motivation out of you. Write this report, you get a bonus. Uh, write this report or you're fired. Uh, if you really want to write this report, uh, you know, I don't. But the top one says, here's the most positive one. I really want it. It's intrinsic. It's something that you make a decision ahead of time. You can't wait for somebody else to light the fire under you. It's something you make a choice for. Only one creates positive, sustainable motivation. If you're motivated by fear or worry or discouragement or disappointment, it won't last. Why do you think, I said this last week, 97% of people who make a New Year's resolution, they give up within a month. Why? There's not a sustainable motivation or reason to do it. There has to be something intrinsic, something deep inside you that says, I want to make this change. Not just because I want to stay away from problem A or problem B. I want to make this change because I want more. Does that make sense? Have you ever said to yourself, I want more than what I've got in life? but yet you haven't taken the steps to get there? That's a crazy thought, isn't it? I, I like what Zig Ziglar, uh, he just passed away this last year. 
a great Christian man that wrote this. He said, people often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it. Yeah, it's important. You know, you got to do it on a regular basis. There's got to be something that goes inside you that gives you that push, that gives you the reason to go forward. You know, if you ever looked at a pyramid of what it looks like for the hierarchy of motivation, uh, there's no motivation. And we all know people like that. There's just nothing going on there. There's another motivation that says, I want to please other people. And that motivates a lot of people. I'm trying to please a family member or a friend or a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a mother, a father. And there's another one doing it for, these, these are all extra, and that means that it won't last. I do another one just for reward. The last one, the intrinsic, but it's done for the inherent joy. You're, you're doing it because you know that's the right thing to do. You know, because motivation comes in all forms and shapes, doesn't it? You know, uh, it's funny because uh, this great white, and, and this is off the coast of Hawaii, this great white was almost 20 feet long. Motivation, is there a better reason to paddle? <laughs> Could you imagine that? What motivates you right now? What is the single most intrinsic part of motivation that you're looking for this year? You know, Jacob was looking for it, but he was doing it for all the wrong reasons. He wasn't doing it for the right reason. And see, if God is going to give you a big change and a big result, then you're going to have to find the right reason or you'll do the same thing you've always done. It's fascinating. He had 400 men that were coming with him. Jacob was greatly afraid, distressed. You almost want to say, duh, right? And, and, and then he divided the people that were with him, the flocks and the herds and the camels, into two different companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, the other company which is left will escape. See, he was already planning on losing and sometimes going into the next stage of your life, you've already made up your mind you're going to lose. That mindset says, here's what I've been practicing. I don't see a way out. You're hoping somebody will rescue you. We weren't made to exist. We were made to thrive. But for some reason, as a child of God, we've accepted mediocrity to the point where we're hoping that somebody comes through for us. <clears throat> Jacob uh, said, oh God of my father. All of a sudden, he got close to God. Oh God of my father Abraham, verse 9, God of my father Isaac. He's going down the family tree line talking about all the people that walk with God. Isn't that great? You start going back to what worked. That's the issue here. God wants you to go back to what works. He doesn't want you to go back to what didn't work. The God of my father Isaac, the, the Lord who said to me, return to your country. You know, he said, wait a minute, you told me to do this. You know, it's funny when God talks to us, a lot of times we act like we didn't understand. We know exactly what's going on. Return to your country and your family and I'll deal well with you. He's going, wait a minute, what you're sending my way is wrapped in adversity, wrapped in possible death and separation from my family, loss of all my flocks, loss of all my resources, loss of my identity and my integrity. He says, everything that's coming against me, you said you're going to bless, but yet it looks bad right now. And that's what you're probably saying about that thing that you haven't dealt with. But that looks bad. God says, that's not what it's about. I find it fascinating what he says in verse 10. I'm not worthy of the least of all your mercies. You start to get a little humble. And of all the truth which you have shown your servant, God was giving him insight. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. He goes, already my life is starting to come unraveled. You ever felt like your life was unraveled a little bit? Wheels are coming off a little bit? Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with my children. For you say, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. You know, we need motivation, but you have to have the right kind of motivation. There's several things. You can write this down. This is important stuff. If you learn how to take the right steps, your motivation will be sustained. If you're going to wing it, or you think you know, or you're smarter than somebody else, or smarter than God, guess what? You're going to get exactly what you plan for. You know, look at this. Determine your goals. You've got to write those goals. We've talked about this in the past. If you don't write down your goals, guess what? 
Nobody else will do it for you. Okay? Uh, maintain a positive attitude. You've got to stay in God's word. You've got to have and attract the right people in your life. you got to have people that are heading in the direction you want to go. That's why it's important to have good people around you, godly people. Because if you have somebody that's apart from that, they're not going your way. Leave our personal problems aside. You've got to start saying, I release that into God's hand. I release that into God's hand. I've got to stop carrying every issue in my life. The reason why many people take their problems personal is because they're carrying too much. You're not designed to do that. Upgrade your knowledge and skill. You've got to find out what does God want to say to you? What does he want to equip you with? What is he trying to say to you right now that would change the approach that you need to have? Be passionate. When you find out what that goal is, he says, then you've got to attach your emotions to it. More often than not, get this right now, this is important. We attach our emotions to our problems. We, we spend more time worrying, fearing, doubting, discouraged, disappointed, drop out, cop out, rest, all that stuff based on our problems and we attach emotions to it. If you attach your emotions to your passion and your goals, guess what? You can't be stopped. You know what? Because God gave it to you. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And lastly, decrease or eliminate energy drains. What drains you of your energy? What drains you of your passion? What drains you of your direction? What drains you of your attention? What drains you of where you need to go on a regular basis? Is it a person, a place, a thing? Is it your health? Is it your money? Is it, what is it that constantly pulls all those things that you hold dear in your life away from you? This is good stuff. And he wants you to understand that. You know, the fascinating thing about this is when I look at things like this and pray about things like this and study for these things and then think about the people God's drawing into us, I keep thinking, oh, God gives me this idea because he knows you need this and you need this and you need this. He knows exactly what you need. See, when I preach, it's fascinating. I never once think about one person except for my wife. And only use good illustrations about your wife. Amen? Amen. You know what that means? It means good cooking. <laughs> so when I think about each and every one of you, it's how do I get them from this place to that place. That's the single most important thing I could do for you. I got to get you from 2014 and to not just get there, but to the greatest year of your life. And if I don't do that, you've wasted your time. See, when, when you think about this, commitment means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do. Long. This is good. Commitment means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. I got to get you to attach your emotions somewhere else besides your issues. If you keep replaying and rehearsing all the problems in your life, you won't succeed. That's a guarantee. I'll give it to you right now. Or your money back. But if you learn this, that your commitment is being loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. The biggest problem is I'll get you in the right mood on a Sunday morning and then Monday morning hits you, right? And then you reattach that emotion over the commitment, the loyalty, the faithfulness you said you'd give to God, and you attach it to a problem, an issue, a worry, a doubt, a fear. You're tired, you're worn out. You ever felt too tired and you just don't feel like going on anymore? It's because you've attached yourself to the wrong thing. See, in 2015, I want the people of this church to be revitalized. Mentally, physically, spiritually, psychologically, and emotionally. I want you to get to a place where you're walking around and you got a bounce in your step. Not because you had too much coffee or a Red Bull or five-hour energy drink. You got a bounce in your step because you know God's up to something good. So when you think about this, big changes for big results, you need the right motivation to surrender to God. You've got to retrain your mind why you're surrendering to God. If you're doing it for just religious purposes, You've missed God's voice completely. And secondly, think about this. Big changes uh, for big results. God accepted worship is in all we have to offer. And I'll explain that. Sounds difficult, doesn't it? But in my little mind, it makes sense. 
what I think about when I think about this, remember the scripture we read first, Romans 12, 1. Let's read this together because it, it just, I want to hear your silky smooth voice. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Isn't that fascinating? He says, when you learn to sacrifice who you are, where you're going, and what your goals and dreams are, you're on the road to worship. Just because you sing good, just because you wrote a check, just because you did A, B, and C, that does not mean you worship God this morning. Because you went, oh, I, I was in church, and what happened? We sang songs. What else? Oh, I gave an offering. Oh, what else? I shook the pastor's hand. What else? I ate too many donuts. You know, what, what else? You know, and you go through the list of all the things, the criteria that the outside person, outside of somebody who should be worshiping God, would think that's common. They think that's the stepping pattern for this. But he says, no, it's not it. He says, it's got to be something more. You know, it can't just be rules and regulations, because guess what? If it's a rule or a regulation, or trying to hang out on the Ten Commandments, I talked about that last week, and I even showed the Ten Commandments, just so you guys would be refreshed on what the Ten Commandments look like. And, and somebody want to stand up and give them from one to, okay, we won't do that. So when you think about this, we end up making it a rules and regulation thing instead. If we have a rule or regulation, what will we do? We will break it. Isn't that true? Kind of like when you, you ever see somebody park in the wrong place? They park in front of a fire hydrant, <coughs> fire department came. Instead of going around the BMW, they broke both windows, stuck the hose up, and connected it. That'll teach them not to break the rules. See, if you want to play the rules and regulation thing, there's a payment that you'll have to go through. Isn't that fascinating? There's a payment if you're just going to do rules and regulations. Or you're going to try and do performance. You think you're better than everybody else? Well, go ahead and park your Mercedes over four different spaces, and somebody's not going to be happy with you. I guarantee it. When you think you're above everybody else, they're going to let you know you are not. Or you think, well, I'm going to obey God because I'm scared of God. Well, the problem with that is, even a dog can do that. <laughs> He'll obey the skunk because the skunk will light him up like a Christmas tree. And if you want to know what a skunk smells like, come up to our house sometimes when one of our dogs tangles with a skunk. He still hasn't learned that process yet. You know, and we, we do it based on, I'm scared God's going to wipe me out. You know, that's not a relationship either. That's rules and regulations. In Genesis 32, and it's fascinating, verse 13, Jacob's still fighting through this process. He says, so he lodged there the same night and, took the, and came uh, with his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. He's going to bribe him. He's going to try and pay him off. He's going to try and get him, if I give him enough stuff, he's going to like me. 200 male goats. Look at all that he's providing. That's 200 male goats. That's a lot. Back in those days, that's a lot of money. Uh, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels, 30 colt, or their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 foals. First of all, the camp's going to smell better once these animals leave, right? Yeah. He says... 20 female donkeys, 10 foals, and then he delivered them to the hand of his servants. Look, look at the process in which he works through this. Uh, and his servant, er, every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. He wants to do this in waves. He wants to give one gift, then he wants to give him another gift, and, and he wants to overwhelm him with stuff so he'll not be mad and want to kill him. He's trying to pay him off. And he, that's what we do with God. We, oh, I do A, B, and C. If you just don't do this to me or, or you'll do this for me. We may, have you ever made a deal with God? Ever bargain with him that if I do all these things and be a good kid, you're going to take care of me? That's rules and regulations. It's not a relationship. And Jacob had not crossed past that area. Now, it's fascinating when you think about this. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, to them it's sin. He says, it's not about performance, because there are times you're supposed to do things you're supposed to do, and you don't do them. So if you're worried about the game-playing thing with God, he says, there's stuff I've asked you to do a long time ago, and you still haven't done it. He doesn't want that from us. That's why he tries to tell us. I, I love 2 Corinthians 9, 6, because Paul's trying to issue in a, a, a whole new look at what needs to be done. Uh, he says, now this I say, I'm sorry, it, it got blurry. He or she who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. 
And he and she who sows bountifully, they'll also reap bountifully. He says, you know, the issue is, is how much are you willing to give of yourself? I, I want you first. Paul talks about that to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians. He says, they first gave themselves to God, then they gave themselves to us to support the ministry. It's not about how much you give. It's where is your heart. Because if your heart isn't right, even what you give is not worth anything. Does that make sense? You ever get a gift from somebody you knew they didn't really want to give you a gift? Even though it was an expensive gift, they had the money to do it. But did you ever get something from somebody that was just simple and small, but they meant it? It made a difference, didn't it? You know, I find it fascinating because he tries to encourage us in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 9, let each one give as they purpose in their heart. So if your heart's wrong, it doesn't matter. But if it's right, not grudgingly or of necessity for the Lord, he loves a cheerful gift. He loves somebody that's going to do it for the right reasons. Jacob was doing it for all, he was trying to cover his rear end is what he was trying to do. He commanded the first one, verse 17, Esau, my brother, meet you, ask you, saying, to whom do you belong? And where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? In verse 18, then you shall say, they are your servant Jacob's. Jacob's giving you a gift. It's got Jacob's name written all over it. It's a present sent to my Lord Esau, and behold, he is also behind us. He's coming. So he's trying to soften the blow. Uh, in verse 19, so he commanded the second, and then the third, and all who follow the droves, in this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. So by the time I get there, he's going to be buttered up. And also say, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. That, that, that's really what he was shooting for. You know, I, I find it fascinating. You know, when I think about the term wisdom, knowledge applied, it says, can be defined as seeing a situation as God does. That's really what true wisdom is. Do you see it as, as God sees it? Acting on it as God wills. And then learning from it as God intended all along. That's what real wisdom is. It's a fascinating thought. When he tries to, to tell him, you know, your servant Jacob is behind us. He's the one that's doing this. Verse 19, he commanded the second and the third, and he said, uh, you, you tell Esau this. Verse 20, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us, for he will appease him with the present that goes before me. Afterward, I will see his face, and perhaps he'll accept me. So the present went over uh, before him. But he himself, Jacob, lodged that night, in the camp. Jacob held back because he was still, he wasn't sure. You know, when you don't move forward, you're not, we talked about this last week, being proactive and then progressive. Being able to not only gather the information, which is wisdom, uh, and then being proactive that I'm, I'm engaged with the process, and then being progressive, meaning I'm going forward with it. See, you can't say I'm a Christian, but I don't do anything with it. You can't say, oh, I got a gym membership, but you don't go, right? It's fascinating, and I've said this many times. If you have a part-time job, do they, do they give you full-time benefits? No. no, they don't. Why? Because you're not fully there. You're not all the way committed. But if you have a full-time job and they offer full-time benefits, that's the people that get it, right? Same thing with God. If you're a child of God and you're part-timing and dabbling with Him and just listening and agreeing, He says, and not doing anything with it, you're part-timing me. Of course I'm not moving on your behalf. Of course you don't feel joy and passion and a reason for life. The purpose of God is wrapped up in the heart of man. You know, the finality of that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8 says, look at this, this is for you if you're ready to get in the game. God is able to bless you abundantly. He says, I I'll bless you so much that you'll just go, stop. Wouldn't you like to tell God to stop blessing you? Have you ever had to do that? It's rare I've heard. Most people say, oh, God, I need this, and God, this problem here, and God, and I, I, I'm not happy, and I'm not joyful, I'm not passionate, I don't have energy, I don't, I don't have what it takes to live this life. I'm not, I'm, I live in the greatest country in the world, and I'm still not happy about life. You ever thought about that? Isn't that crazy? You live in the greatest free country in the world, flaws and all, and have God within your heart and the Word of God around you and the Holy Spirit driving uh, through your life and people who love you, they're walking head in the same direction, and you're still not going over the top with your life. 
God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, it's not just in one area, God wants to bless you in ways that you don't even know yet. Are you listening? Say amen. 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 In all things, at all times, having all that you need, he says that everything you've got, God knows every need you've got, you will abound in every good work. He says everything that you start to get involved with will be absolutely yours. You know, I, I find it fascinating because when you think about it, he always gives us a trial of planning in the face of uncertainty regarding the future. You ever, you ever felt that way? Uncertain about your future? Join the club, okay? The test. I ask God to direct both my plan and my... You ever done that? Ask God, direct my plan and the execution of it. I, I want to see A, B, and C come together. Lastly, the temptation. I make my plans and I expect God to go along with it. There's your biggest flaw. You want him to do something on your behalf, but you still got your own plan. In fact, you'll run to it before you'll run to him because it's comfortable. You know, I find it fascinating because when you think about what Rick Warren says, there's an instant obedience will teach you more about God than a lifetime of Bible discussions. You can go home just on that. Instant. That means right now. Not when you get home. Not on Monday. Not next week. Not by the end of the month. Instant obedience. See, if I was going to lose weight, I couldn't say, well, starting January 1st, I'm, you, know, you know what that sounds like? Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. As soon as I, I woke up, you can ask my wife, I woke up that morning, we didn't have a discussion, I just said, I am not going to go down the way I've been going physically. I may hit the gym and do all these right things, but I'm going to make a bunch of changes if it's really going to happen. But I've got to do it today. Today's the day. And instant obedience will teach you more about God. If you, I don't care if you go to Bible studies every night. I don't care if you never miss a Sunday morning. I don't care if you listen to it on tape and get online or on the radio. Instant obedience will teach you more about God than a lifetime of Bible discussions. You know why? Because if you're not obedient, all the stuff you hear will go right back out the back door. Instant obedience changes your life. You want 2015 to be off the charts? Instant obedience. You want the things that you're worried about and fearful about coming up and stuff that you don't even know about yet? Instant obedience. You want your joy and you want life to count again? Instant obedience. You want to break the pattern of mediocrity or your comfort zone, the place where you've been stuck for so long you don't know there's something better? Instant obedience. So when you think about big change for big results, you need the right motivation to surrender to God. Number two, God accepted worship is in all and how much you offer. It's got to be everything or it's not worship. And lastly, when God gets his way with you, blessings follow. That's what it is. Blessings follow. You can't help but win. You're going to stumble all over the best part of your life based on the fact that you have instant obedience. When he has every area of your life, he doesn't have to fight you. Do you have areas in which you've got to fight with God about? You know, when I made up my mind about eating differently, I had to make sure that it didn't, I didn't have to have a fight with all the stuff that's in our house. Right now, where it's at, where, I know where every goodie is in every cupboard and the spots even my wife hid. <laughs> True confessions. I know how much is there. I know how much I could take without her knowing. Well, at least I think I know. <laughs> right? It's like I set my plate down with a steak a while back, and I set it down... And uh, this was a while back. And right on the table, or it was a burger or something, something that was good, and something that was red meat. And, and set it there. And then the dogs both, they walked away because I went and went to the bathroom. And I came back. I was telling something, all my dogs are obedient. You know, they mess with that. He goes, well, how do you know they didn't lick it? I'm like, wow, I didn't think about that. Because <laughs> we can always act like we're obedient, right? <laughs> when everybody's watching you know, and when you get to this point where you think about it, you feel like, you know, and the odds may be just like this woman trying to hold off this just an amazing amount of people in riot gear. You may feel like that right now. You may feel like you can't stop what's coming. And you know what? You're right. Only with God can you do it. But you can't continue with your same... I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and it's up to me. 
It's up to you. You will be just like that woman. You'll eventually lose. You know, it's fascinating when he says in, in verse 2 of Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. He says, I want you to transform. Metamorphize is the Greek word for that, where we get the term from a caterpillar that transforms into a butterfly. It's a slow process. It doesn't happen overnight. But he says, i got to get your mind changed on these things. It's difficult. Trust me, it's very difficult. Maybe you heard of this guy. Uh, this is Casey Stengel. He's a baseball player, obviously. And for many years, he was one of the feistiest, fightingest, if that's a word, baseball player in all of Major League Baseball. Back in the early teens and 20s, uh, he was one of the most prolific hitters and fielders, but he got in more fights than everybody else. In fact, most of the fans hated him, even when he played at his home park, they hated him. When he'd go through a, a small slump where he'd strike out several times in a row for a couple of games because he swung at everything, that was his, his note of affection, was he never saw a ball he didn't like to swing at, is he'd go back out in the field, and for uh, many times he would give them the bird, the number one single, uh, signal and, and he'd get fined or benched or suspended from the team. So finally one day he started to wise up a little bit. He went out after striking out for the third time in a game. Uh, and it's fascinating. He goes out there and he lifted his cap. Instead of giving everybody the bird, he lifted his cap and he had a small sparrow on top of his head and it flew off. So in essence he was still giving them the bird. <laughs> He was a feisty guy even when he started to manage. He, he took the job as the New York Yankees uh, manager. They had not been very good at that particular point, and they needed a big change, so they were going to go for a guy they thought could fire up the club. Well, early on, he started to fight and argue with every umpire. That was his note. That was his style. That was his approach. He had one guy named Baron Edwards, who was a great umpire, and he decided because the call was so bad, he came out and started to argue and he fainted. He acted like he passed out and fainted right at the feet of the umpire. He said, that'll get everybody's attention and know how important that call was. When he lifted his head up, he looked up and realized the umpire laid on the ground next to him just to show him that it caused him to faint just as much. <laughs> and he realized he had to change his approach. Do you know when he changed his mind about his tactics, he took the New York Yankees in a 10-year span to 10 pennants and seven World Series. But he had to change his mind. The way he was going, he was not going to win. And God's got to get an, an impression upon you that you can't win doing it the same way over and over again. You can't do it. You know, and, and if you think about this, in Psalm 18, verses 25 and 26, to the faithful, God says he shows himself faithful. If you're faithful, guess what? He's going to show up as faithful to you as well. To those with integrity, you show yourself integrity. You know, God's going to be true to you all the time. Uh, to the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the wicked, you're going to show yourself hostile. It's a promise. How are you showing yourself to God? You can fool everybody else and even yourself, but you can't fool him. He knows exactly where your heart is. He's never fooled. Being omniscient, that wonderful theology, just means he knows everything. When I think about old Jacob, he needed a change big time. He wasn't planning on a change he was going to get. None of us do. In verse 21, he says he was alone at camp. He sent everybody off. That's when God gets his best message to us. When he, we get all the information, we finally get alone long enough for God to speak to us. Verse 22 says he arose that night, took two wives. And there was part of the issue, amen? No, I'm just kidding. He took two wives and two female servants and 11 sons. Crossed over, you think you've got a lot of uh, issues with, with children and raising it. He had 11 kids. Crossed over the fort of Jabbok and took them, uh, sent them over the brook, sent over uh, what he had, and Jacob was left alone, with, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. What a remarkable thing. The scene is unbelievable. I, I think that, you know, until you finally spend enough time alone with God, as he says in Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I'm God. You've got, you got to have, you got to have the, 
the radio off, the TV off, you got to be away from people, you got to stay off your phone and your computer. And sometimes, I think one of the practices you need to do for this week, if you want anything to take home, is just spend a block of time where there's no interruptions. You know, when you go to a five-star restaurant, and you go through one of their, like a nine-course meal, I don't know if you've ever done that, but if it's, if it's a legitimate one, what they'll do is they'll bring you something to drink to cleanse your palate after each plate that you have. So you can get a fresh taste of the new thing the chef creates for you. Because otherwise it blends, and then you lose your ability to taste the next item. If you want a fresh voice from God, you got to be still and, and cleanse your mental and emotional and spiritual palate. Does that make sense? When I think about this, when you don't renew your mind, you're feeling, get this, I'm hoping you're getting this. When you don't renew your mind, your feelings will always take you back to what you got delivered from. Your feelings are going to come back for the same issues, same problems, same worries, same insufficiencies and insecurities you've carried all your life. And unless you get your mind changed, you will attach, an emo get this, you will attach the same emotion to the same issues over and over and over again. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. See, it, this is a big deal if you're going to change your life. I, I take it very serious. I hope you do too. You know, when I study and pray and look for slides and illustrations and stories, my, my goal is that by the time you leave, you're going to go, wow, i got to do that. i got to try that. You know, it's fascinating. Uh, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Wrestling is a tough sport. I had several buddies that were all-American wrestlers. I have one, a, a friend of mine, his brother was an All-American wrestler at the University of Oklahoma. He was six foot two, 360 pounds. He couldn't catch you, couldn't catch me, I wouldn't let him. But if he did, he'd break your wrist. Or he'd just lay on you. He was huge. And he was a jerk, too. He wrestled all night long. Now, what makes this interesting about this is this. Jacob was 97 years old when he got in this wrestling match. You say, oh, well, look where I'm at in life. I don't know if I can do that. You have no idea what you can do until you allow God to do something in and through your life. If you're in a position right now where God wants to wrestle with you, don't make any more excuses. Because at some point, he's going to ask you to become great, and he doesn't want to hear your reasons why you don't want to. Or there's a, this person's just better than I am. Or that person got the better break. That's an excuse. He wrestled all night long, the breaking, you see the sun coming up, and they're just, he just you ever watch the, uh, the, the, what do they call it? MMA fighters? Sometimes they just get on the ground, they hold each other, and they, you know, and that's exhausting. And I could just see, it was fascinating, I could just see God laying over there. He didn't, he could have beat him at any time, but he just held him down. And he's just draining the energy out, draining the fight, draining the stubbornness, draining the agenda, draining all the garbage that Jacob had learned to practice up to that point. And God says, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to hold you down until you finally say, I give. And if he's got you in a position right now where you haven't got any other resource, any other doors to go through, uh, any other answers for it, he's trying to get you to just say, I give up. And if you're not ready, that's okay. He'll stay as long as it takes. Now, what's fascinating about this is this. Sometimes when things are falling apart, they may be actually falling into place. And we tend to paint a scenario that's worst case based on the problems we have. God says, uh-uh, you're missing the point here. He's in this wrestling match with him. Look what happens next in verse 25. When he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. The socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint. as he So he injured him a little bit to where now he lost even more leverage to be able to fight back. And if you're not, get this, if you're not ready to give in 
<clears throat> He'll take one more thing out of your life in order to get your attention. He said, let me go before the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. You know, Jacob was stubborn. Jacob wanted God's best. Now, I find it fascinating when you read Scripture. I know that's difficult. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. You do not delight in sacrifice, or, or I bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. God is not after something. He's after you. What is God after in your life? you got to ask better questions if you're going to have a better year. And I love what Jacob did. He says, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. He was hanging on to dear life. He knew I needed to go to that next spot, and I can't do it unless you do it for me. Unless God's involved, you can't win. So finally, he says in verse 27, he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He knew exactly what the name meant, and so did God. He says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. You struggle with God and with men, and I prevail. With God, that's what Israel means. With God, you're a prince. With God, you're a princess. You can't become what you're supposed to become without God. And he changed his name, changed his nature, changed his attitude. Jacob said, tell, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, what is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. Didn't even get into that. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. See, God wants you to get face to face with him at some point and do business this year. He really does. You know, when you think about it, when you have increased obedience, increased blessings follow. And then increased happiness and love for God. It's a cycle. That, you, all of us have practiced cycles that have defeated us, haven't we? You played out the same scenario, same emotions, same agenda over and over again, and you haven't gotten any joy. But if you increase your obedience, it has increased blessings with it. And then that means increased happiness and love. You should be the most enthusiastic person anybody meets based on the fact that you're a child of God. In theos is the, uh, it's fascinating, the Latin word for enthusiasm. In and theos, in God. That's what theos is in Greek as well. When you're in God, when you're fully obedient to Him, you can't stop anybody like that. <clears throat> so he passed over Peniel. The sun rose on him. Look at this. And he limped on his hip. All of a sudden, everything changed because now he's got a reminder that, that you know what, I can't do it on my own. Therefore, this day the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. Fascinating thought. Never say never when it comes to what God can do. You say never now because it's about you. But if it's about God, you won't be able to say it's impossible. You know how I know this? Here's how it played out. Listen to this. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. There was Esau coming with him and 400 men. If he hadn't gone through this, he'd have been in total fear. God may allow Esau to wipe him out. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and two maidservants, put the men, maidservants, the children in front. You know, he wasn't even going to be out front. And Leah and his children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them, bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau, look at this. Esau's heart had changed. Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him. And they both wept. Healing had occurred. And he can come home. That's what God wants to do with you. He wants you to heal. And come home. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for a chance to just uh, hear what you have to say to us. Sometimes, uh, even for myself, I know that we can doubt and fear and worry because it's an old habit emotionally that we practice. And then we can play out the same year we had last year and uh, begging and pleading with you to somehow change things when in reality you've got to change us first. And I'm praying where we're sitting right now that uh, there are commitments, there are lines that we're crossing, 
and we're ready to step across to where 2015 can become the greatest year of our entire life. And set us up for a future that's absolutely brilliant. And uh, I just pray, Father, these commitments will not be emotional, but they'll be authentic. And uh, we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Mm -hmm.